Our first speaker is Marit Puryavi, and she is an exploratory tester extraordinaire with a day job at Vaisala as principal test engineer. She is an empirical technologist, a tester, and a polyglot programmer, a catalyst for improvement, a speaker, and an author, and a community facilitator. She has been awarded two prestigious global testing awards, the most influential Agile Testing Professional Person 2016 and Eurostar Testing Excellence Award 2020. She was also selected as top 100 most influential in ICT in Finland 2019 and 2020. She's spoken at events in 25 countries, delivering over 400 sessions. And with 25 years of exploratory testing under her belt, she crafts her work role into a mix of hands-on testing and programming and leading and enabling others. She leads Tech Voices, enabling new speakers. She blogs at www.visible-quality.blogspot.fi. And she's the author of three books, including Ensemble Programming Guidebook, Exploratory Testing, and strong style pair programming. She's here today to speak to us about breaking illusions with testing. And with that, I now hand over the control to Marit. You should be now having my screen there as well. We're gonna spend next half an hour with some of my experiences. I've curated very heavily the experiences that I can fit into this session out of my 25 years in, in testing. And all of this, we get uh, the, the topic of the talk are around breaking illusions with testing. Let's start with a story. Uh, in the last week, I worked at my place of work, just like I always do. And I've been working on testing a new weather uh, station. That's something that my team is, is building. And we are approaching a major release in that. So one of the things I've done in the last week is introduced uh, within JIRA uh, test cases that are only single line uh, summaries. There's nothing within these, just as a mechanism of, of getting my whole team to participate in the uh, release efforts, in the release-related testing that needs to happen. It's caused a lot of discussion in my, my current team, as in, are you sure you don't give us any detailed instructions on what exactly to do? Are you sure we don't need to write down exactly instructions on what we need to do? And seeing that discomfort in people that they do write exactly what they did, just in case they need to be kind of on the safe side later on about uh, what they've done within an, an idea. Uh, the thing uh, that happened, though, is, is that with the complete freedom of deciding what you would do within one of these test cases, what I've ended up with is finding bugs that we should have found earlier, but we haven't found until we could let go of our almost uh, uh, obsession around writing down the details and following orders, which is in this particular company's culture. So this as a recent example of a way of breaking an illusion that test cases in some organizations might be expected to be very deep. There's plenty of, of different kinds of illusions. And one particularly heavy one that I want to talk to you about today is a few years ago. I was testing a system an open source library, a test library called approval tests. I spent just a few hours on preparing to figure out how to do uh, a, a group testing session on this particular library, collaborating uh, with the, the um, uh, originator of the library, the developer who had created it, and asking for permission, like, is it okay that I'm going to be using this for some of my conferences? Uh, where I want to do hands-on testing with people on something that doesn't have a user interface. And his response, I'm quoting him uh, from a, a podcast here, is like, well, you know, like, you know, you want to test the approval tests. And, and he's like, you know, yeah, go for it. Uh, it's all written test first. It's code that he was really proud of. 
And yet it ends up that as per his words, I managed to somehow destroy his software uh, in like an hour and a half. First of all, I think he was a little bit uh, underestimating the amount of time that I used. It's probably more like two, two and a half hours that I spend on, on, on doing that. And I had the full access of asking questions, collecting ideas, collecting ideas of functionalities from him so that it made it very easy for me to pick up things uh, that uh, might be off ending the risks in a deep level quite quickly, giving the full access to the developer. But what I kind of took out of this experience is, is that I needed to remind my fellow developer of a very famous uh, thing that we, we talk about in the testing field, that testers actually were not in the business of breaking the code, we're in the business of breaking illusions about the code. And actually, we're not just breaking illusions about the code, we're breaking illusions pretty much about anything. So for me, having spent 25 years in this industry, pretty much repeating this story where I surprise developers, I surprise business people about the contributions that I might end up making as a tester, I find that over the years I've grown and grown and grown in, in the types of things that I consider illusions that are within my realm to break. So me, while some of them are still about showing bugs in the software, I still spend about half of my, my days at office uh, on hands-on testing of software, finding bugs and having conversations with my fellow team members, all the different stakeholders in the organization. Uh, the other half generally goes into somehow improving the organization. And there's even bigger illusions that we hold around the ways of working including the test cases that I now need to be actively breaking as part of my day-to-day -day job, that uh, taking away some of the value that we could have in testing. So we'll talk a little bit more about those type of things. So instead of saying uh, that testers don't break the code, they just break illusions about the code, we could actually say that testers are in the business of breaking illusions about whatever is necessary. So it doesn't have to be even only on the code. It could be anything around that space. So I've looked at various illusions for quite many years now, trying to understand like what does this mean in practice for the work that I am doing, the, the uh, choices that I make as a principal test engineer in my organization. And I'm realizing that uh, there's uh, three what I call basic illusions, and there's three what I call now other illusions. I haven't I figured out a better way of talking about them yet than, than calling them other illusions. The basic illusions are what we traditionally understand as the work of a tester. It's not just finding bugs against specification, the code doing what it's supposed to do, but it's also understanding the requirements, finding whatever missing requirements, misunderstood requirements we might have, in making sure that the product that we are uh, delivering is also high quality in the sense that it uh, fulfills expectations, reasonable expectations, not only of the users, but different stakeholders, our uh, business folks uh, trying to decide on when we can sell it and how we can sell it, our uh, support organizations in figuring out what kind of extra services we could either uh, uh, sell on top of the product or uh, that are part of the product as, uh, as we're selling it right now. And then also on the third uh, category, the product's doing well, basically only what it's supposed to do. I think security uh, features, security uh, vulnerabilities in particular, are in this category of illusions. That sometimes we think we build it right, but we didn't think in uh, having a password that is strong enough or we didn't think in not having a third party library that ends up being a route uh, into getting to whatever our system is, is supposed to uh, protect. So all of these different basic illusions, the code, uh, breaking the code, breaking illusions around the code are very much the foundation of what we call testing. But applying the testing skills then on the other illusions, uh, on the ideas that uh, are leading us to code, I find that there are at least three categories of those. There's the processes, the ways we work together, the agreements that we make, the practices that we follow, so that we're able to deliver with a change in mind, meaning uh, being able to learn, being able to do things 
differently as soon as we realize what's more right than what we used to be doing before we learned. People uh, and people skills. We often have ideas that, you know, since we were already hired for a particular position, like myself, I am a tester, that it already means that I would have all the skills uh, that I need to deliver. But actually, the technologies around us are changing. And a lot of times I find that there's many illusions that we need to break in the day to day life around the idea that there are still ways, even if we knew how to do something, there are still ways of doing them more effectively and bringing those out, out in the open is an important illusion to break. And the third category here, the business models, driving our selection of what's the right thing to do for our users. My favorite examples are definitely in this space where sometimes figuring out that you don't even need to deliver a feature. You can just deliver a contract with the prepayment and you will learn that the customer was never ready to actually put their money where their mouth is. They were just asking for a feature, but when we're talking about paying for that feature, it changes the tone and changes the outcome of the, the conversation. And this is a change uh, in organizations that I've been through uh, over the uh, years so many times that I've kind of come to the conclusion that we really need to uh, apply the testing critical thinking skills way beyond just uh, whatever the requirements are and, and whatever we are agreeing to deliver and across the organization, actually across multiple organizations, across a society to be doing uh, things in a proper way in the software industry. So all of these different illusions there's so many stories that I could tell. So I've chosen uh, for this presentation today, I've chosen three main illusions that I want to share with you in a more uh, depth uh, of kind of uh, uh, the illusions that have ended up broken, where I have needed to learn and my teams around me, my organizations around me, have needed to learn that things can be different. We'll first talk about uh, pair testing. Uh, an ensemble testing. So we'll talk about the, uh, what uh, a pair and a group work uh, remotely in particular is. So quality practices in the new state of the world where we actually have this possibility of doing globally conferences uh, at the same time, uh, being in different places of the world, doing the same thing with software development and how to be really actually effective on that. So we'll talk a little bit on, on that space. Then we'll talk about results-oriented exploratory testing. So that's definitely my favorite of all of the things to do. And it kind of was the, the opening story that I also had on, on how to make a developer with a very short time frame surprised on the results that a tester can deliver. So how does that work? And then on the third one, this is maybe the most commercial of these three things that I've chosen here. But I felt that because it's so controversial, the idea that a team could work with a Scrum Master and a product owner and be better for those uh, is an illusion that I needed to break in my previous place of work. And it is something where I am seeing definitely the same kind of, of symptoms and possibilities in my current organization. But let's talk about that a little bit more. So starting with uh, the pair and ensemble uh, testing and ensemble, uh, pair and ensemble programming. Uh, now for the last year, we've been pretty much all uh, working remotely, uh, uh, pretty much kind of everywhere in the world, uh, including me not going to my office uh, office, even though it's a fairly short drive away, rather I'm working from my home and, and enjoying the fact that I have an extra hour every single day for doing, doing things. At the same time, as this change of, of working remotely has happened globally by the, the, the pandemic that we are experiencing, the change that has happened only in places and locally is the increased amount of pair and ensemble work. With pair work, I mean two people working together. And with ensemble, I mean a whole group, uh, maybe a whole team, maybe an intermix of couple of teams, but a whole group working together on a single task. Uh, 
And this is very much possible to do now that we have uh, remoteness hands. Sharing your screen, sharing control of your screen is possible, and it is actually a very effective way of both contributing learning at the same time uh, with whatever colleagues you have happen to have in that session. The key part of this to work, the key illusion that I've needed to kind of break a lot around this, this idea that sometimes people are more comfortable by being alone, but we are also fairly slow when we are alone. And it is really hard to ask for things you don't know, you don't know. So hitting your head against the wall is not the best practice. Sharing your screen to show someone else what you are hitting your head against and figuring that out together, either in a pair or even in an entire team, is a much better practice. The way this is usually organized so that it works, and it's not just one person watching, uh, or one person doing and the others watching, either in a pair format or in this ensemble format, is that we need learn to move away from a traditional idea of how we work together into what we call now a strong style uh, way of navigating. So rather than saying, hey, I have an idea, give me the keyboard and I'll just speak while I'm writing. We're all, by the way, really bad at talking while we are writing. It, it, we just don't have the bandwidth of doing both of those together. We split these two so that Whoever has the idea says, someone else, take the keyboard. It creates this connection between the whole group or between the pair, uh, the two people in the pair, or even the whole group in, in an ensemble, where everyone can work on the same task. You are using your words to express what you want to happen on that keyboard, and it ends up happening on the other person's keyboard a particularly powerful way of introducing new people into an organization. I've been at Vaisala for now a year and kind of sneakily forcing people into sharing my screen and, and helping me get uh, to learn my work by them pairing with me was a core part of succeeded uh, starting a new job uh, while uh, remotely and also having new people join, even complete newbies to the industry join, and getting to a place where they're much better than they could be if they were just doing their work in their own corner. So learning and contributing are both uh, necessary. This mechanism, why I promote it as one of the big illusions that I really needed to learn away from, is that uh, sometimes we think of this individual work being more efficient, but there's nothing that wins over learning. So if you're doing the same work at exactly the same time, the little image there on the right hand side, and one of you have momentarily uh, in some of the areas uh, uh, are able to do a little quality work, you can, uh, working together as a pair, you can already raise it up to the better of the two of you level. And the more people you add with different profiles and different focus areas, the more flat your, your quality, outcome in quality actually ends up being. So having this immediate feedback, it's, it's hugely valuable. Uh, so even the ensemble format is not wasted time, it's investment into higher quality, uh, less rework and more learning and the learning part of it it is hugely powerful that we are able to learn so if you imagine that you will be able to learn by one percent every single day uh, of the of, of the 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 year uh, you would be 37.8 times your past self in one year and if it takes you the whole week of doing that uh, that one uh, percent improvement it's four better uh, use of your time to provide the same kind of an outcome through anything that you could learn, it already makes you twice the person you were in a year. So investing in this 1% uh, every day, you could use as much as six out of your eight hours a day and you would still be uh, delivering the same results. So focusing on learning is hugely powerful in software development. 
So that's definitely an illusion. Group work is better, uh, even in the remote setting. And we should get comfortable with the idea that whoever holds the idea uses words and the other one holds the keyboard and we should regularly switch. Then the other uh, aspect that I wanted to kind of mention on the uh, breaking illusions is the results oriented exploratory testing. So for me, with 25 years of experience being an explorer, I find that I look at pretty much anything around me, any products, any processes, uh, any ways that of working that we might as uh, uh, sources of, of being more creative and kind of like as if they were my external imagination. Having time with an application is making me more creative. And it's somehow almost as if the software was speaking to me. It's kind of like whispering, you need to click here. <laughs> or it's, it's kind of like, you know, saying, oh, uh, by the way, you did this, but you were a little bit preoccupied somewhere. Maybe you should do it again and pay more attention. So the control is uh, at whoever is doing the testing, uh, not somewhere whoever might have designed the ideas of, of what kind of things we would test. This leads me to a couple of heuristics that kind of drive the, the ideas that I have on testing that I find really relevant. The first one being uh, the idea that we should never ever be bored uh, when we are testing. So uh, when we're finding that we're bored, it means we're not introducing enough change. And this same heuristic applies when we're trying to break the illusions on the level of the organization. So we are looking for common ways of working, but if they start to be something where we always follow exactly the same guidelines, maybe it is a good idea for us to try something different and see if we find effectiveness, efficiency within those, within those changes. So experimenting uh, keeps you away from being bored. Uh, in the beginning, whenever you start with a new project or a new product or a new feature even, and we get these new beginnings almost every single week in software development, there's always something new and exciting coming in. That's when you know the least, so maybe we want to actually frame the whole work that we do around uh, the learning, again, breaking the illusions and also realizing it's not just the developers' uh, uh, illusions we're breaking. We are holders as testers. We are holders of those, those illusions just as much. And sometimes kind of listening to the ways we feel about things uh, from our past experience go of those is the best thing we can do. And then also another heuristic that I really like and appreciate is from Alexandra uh, Schleck uh, from Germany. Uh, the idea that we should be, you know, tweaking with things until we see results. So uh, just as much as with hands-on testing with the application, this provides us a lot of good results, we can do the same thing with our organizations figuring out uh, the little changes that help us get to the value or get to a place where we temporarily lose some of the value and that way learn to appreciate uh, the things that work uh, with uh, the, the uh, existing ways. But we need to be brave in, in seeing both uh, positive and negative results out of changes. If we're afraid of changing, nothing will change. So trying things out in you know, these safe to fail uh, experiments is, is something we need to learn to be comfortable with. There's plenty of, of different kind of heuristics. I don't want to kind of go into this, this in detail today. Just giving you this idea that a great way of learning uh, to think in, in multiple different dimensions and to be able to do that kind of testing where in just a few hours you're surprising other people. It kind of comes from being able to do multifaceted thinking. And for me, the most common thing that I, I end up doing is looking at the environments, looking at the functionalities, looking at the data, looking at the, the use cases, what kind of purposes things are. So uh, things have. So uh, it kind of uh, uh, comes out of uh, one of these uh, typical uh, 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 heuristics that we use, uh, SFDPO, uh, 
is, is the commonly uh, available one. You can find many articles on, on that one. But for me, it's kind of like uh, already in, in the back crown so uh, hard that that the same things come out of of, uh, of me just by thinking about a, a a new problem and finding dimensions to it so we need both short leash and short uh, long leash work uh, working in that and similarly in this area uh, of uh, exploratory testing the, the illusions uh, around systems, like the idea that we would be just testing our own software, we really need to let go of that idea. Uh, if you have uh, a communication application like Signal, and it's running on top of Android platform, and if Android is, is vulnerable, you can't really say that your own on top of it will be vulnerable. And it's always nice to use somebody else's example, but let's say it this way, this really resonates in the day-to-day -day life of the systems that I get to work with in all of the different organizations that I worked in the last 10 years. We keep forgetting that our software doesn't exist uh, other than as part of the system. And, and especially with Agile, it is not an appropriate way of, of uh, uh, putting down the, the work that you're doing by saying that you kind of externalize things around it so this is definitely the challenge of system testing that we we try to do also within the, the teams another thing that is is kind of breaking uh, 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 an illusion in this space is this idea that we would have test automation and exploratory testing somehow separate the way i think of exploratory testing is that we have attended and unattended testing so unattended testing usually happens by some kind of script doing some of that and we do both of these in unison to be learning as much as possible and for me when i look at exploratory testing i start uh, that uh, with automation skills at hand so for me test automation is documentation i could create a mind map i could create a piece of automation and depending on the tooling and depending on the technology you test it actually might be easier to uh, explore with the automation as your documentation, just realizing that you probably will not leave every single piece of code that you created as documentation behind, just like you didn't leave every single note that you ever took uh, behind. So you will make choices of what you keep and what you want. And I find that this is the, the big powerful illusion that we need to break in our teams. Then uh, on the fourth uh, or the third uh, uh, illusion, uh, just kind of briefly giving you an idea and a pointer on what that is. In my previous organization, I was working uh, with a team of 12 people where we made an experiment. I talked about experiments and the idea of experimenting already, where we said we will have no product owner. We already uh, lost or given up on the idea of having a scrum master and now we decided for the three months time frame to also try working without having a product owner because when you have a product owner it very easily turns smart people the engineers into ordinaries people who follow orders and and they leave the important thinking the problem space thinking the customer's perspective thinking for the product owner and we were pretty much in in this uh, scenario with our organization. So instead, what we did is we gave up on having a product owner. Uh, we defined having this very developer-centric, DevOpsian type of uh, way of working, but nothing in the system changes without some lines of code changing. And we had an agreement of not being able to change any of the lines of code without a pull request. The JIRA tickets were completely optional. Nothing changes without the code changing. And there's always someone welcoming a person, welcoming another smart person with their contributions. And if you needed anyone to have a conversation uh, on the ideas that you were trying to work on, there would be people around the organization, UX people, testing people, other developers, even the people who used to identify as product owners who somehow cared and, and spend time uh, with the customer a little bit more were available for these these ideas and the basic idea with continuous delivery is having that value then available 
at the hands of the customer as soon as possible. So continuous delivery, not using Jira, not using any estimates, uh, not having a product owner, everyone in the team kind of, of visualizing together on a whiteboard the types of things we were working on, uh, being committed to the idea of not taking too many things at once and paying attention to the value that comes out of the pipeline, we ended up with uh, uh, the quotes around the organization saying, best team in corporate R&D, and a suspicion that it was probably me uh, being the background product owner and a background scrum master. But since I haven't been in the organization for a year and they're still the best team in corporate R&D, and they are better than they were a year ago as per uh, metrics that uh, we learned to collect, uh, collect that team, I think uh, finding this, this uh, energy uh, into uh, being responsible really for your customers and meeting directly with your customers and helping different people in the organization participate in a smart way in this development process really changed a lot of things on the organization. So to conclude this, I think the breaking illusion sums up to learning. We really are looking for things that are not true. And when we're looking for those things, we need to actively be learning about the things we believe in. And learning is the superpower behind all of this. So we are breaking whatever illusions necessary. We are breaking this idea that it would be somehow someone more senior teaching the more junior ones. We are all learning uh, from one another, regardless of, of what is our background. And sometimes the new person's mind is giving us a great way of looking at things. So if we look at a picture like this, you know, from one angle, it definitely looks like a cat, especially with the text written there. From one angle, it looks like a bird. But we might also be looking at it for the, the uh, emphasis on how the lines are drawn, the used tools on creating this picture, the color of the, and the quality of the paper that it's been drawn on, or uh, how the, the different shapes either are interconnected or are not interconnected on whether they're uh, uh, important. And this multidimensional looking at things is what we do for this team. So as the kind of final piece, I wanted to just show you this little exercise that I often do with people. I make them look at these five different uh, letters and we are doing Scrabble. It's called Bogle actually in Finland, but uh, Scrabble, the word game. And I often make people figure testing out by, by playing with these little physical cubes. There's no way, better way of breaking illusions than uh, having people to do something in a facilitated setting where you can then discuss your learnings. And the lesson that usually comes out of this session is that testing needs to be very much intentional. It's not just using it. You need to also be looking for information with intent. You need to have an idea on what you're doing. Even though you have the idea of what you're doing, chance is still your best friend. So make space for the chance. It's a core learning that comes out of it. Uh, if you have something simple to do, it helps you learn the basics first, positive basic cases first. You can do the complex things later. Uh, if something is hard to test, you are considering testing in isolation. Maybe you should work closer to the developers. So maybe you can build things uh, so that they are easier to test. So collaboration with developers is always a smart move. If you are missing a tool uh, and you speak it, uh, you speak it to the existence. Sometimes uh, uh, you can find a tool by just telling that you're looking for one. So use your words, and and you will be probably getting some. And if you don't have a thing can't pull it out of the organization by speaking it into existence. You can also speak it into existence by finding a group of people that will do it with you. And then finally, uh, the quality of it, it really matters whether someone is willing to do something based on your results. So you will need to have this complicated conversation on what does quality really look like in, in today's world and in the world that you particularly live in. So this sums to serendipity and perseverance, two quotes that I want to leave you with. Arnold Palmer is a, is a golfer, 
And he says things like, uh, the more I practice, the luckier I get. So the more you practice breaking the illusions, the more you find you're able to break them and find out what are worthwhile to spend your time on. And uh, the famous words of Albert Einstein, it's not that he's so close, it's just that he stays with the problems longer. So keep at it and, and keep trying. Uh, longevity is, is important. So all of this sums to deliberate discovery skills. In the middle, you're looking for something. It could be a number or it could be that it is the time of day that we're actually having there. So learn to see those different dimensions with the, the illusions that we have. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Maret. Uh, I see we do not have any questions yet, so perhaps we'd like to remind all of our participants, if you have questions, feel free to go to the stage tab on your screen and um, you can have your questions addressed by our speaker. For now, we don't see any questions, but since you've already shared your contact details, I assume our participants will get in touch with you should they have any queries. So on that note, thank you very much, Maret, for joining us here at our summit. We appreciate your time and your expertise as well. Uh, I'm going to put the slides available. Uh, they are already on SlideShare, so I put the link on the backstage and you can hear it in your, your channels. And I invite everyone to, you know, ask the questions uh, in private by email or in private Twitter. It's not that private, but it's still, you can just ping me there. I'm happy to have a conversation with any one of you at any time. Thank you. Thank you, Marsh. Thank you for joining us. Thanks.